I'd like for you to turn your Bible, if you would please, to the book of Habakkuk. At the book of Habakkuk, but we're going to be spending some time in, um, in the book of Jeremiah. Used to, when I would say, turn in your Bibles, everybody would flip the pages. It would sound like angels' wings fluttering. <laughs> now they say, turn in your Bible, and you hear, boop, boop, boop. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for allowing me to uh, stand in the pulpit tonight and preach. I, I really appreciate it. I'm honored that you would uh, ask me to do that. Well, let's get right into the subject matter tonight and see how much territory we can cover. I've discovered in preparing the message that I'm going to spend almost as much time in Jeremiah as I am in the book of Habakkuk. So uh, bear with me tonight as, as uh, we go through this. Uh, there is a method behind the madness, after all. Most of the prophets in the Bible had a message to deliver. To deliver, for example, uh, Jeremiah said, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, in Ezekiel, it says, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel. Hosea said, the word of the Lord came to Hosea and on through jo uh, Joel and uh, even to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, Zechariah, and um, Malachi. Thus says the Lord of hosts. However, in the book of Habakkuk, uh, we see uh, largely a dialogue between uh, the prophet and God and Habakkuk's opening speech is largely a complaint in the form of a lament and focuses on the evils of society, on God's seemingly inaction in the lives of his people and on Habakkuk's own frustrations. The book of Habakkuk illustrates several major functions. One, we see an, an analysis on society how wicked society was. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Number two, conveying of God's message. Uh, Habakkuk prayed, and God answered his prayer. Uh, but he didn't answer it like Habakkuk wanted. Thirdly, we see an announcement of coming divine judgment. And we're going to spend a large portion of the sermon uh, talking about the coming judgment of Judah from the book of Jeremiah. Then we see in chapter 3 Habakkuk's closing prayer. And then finally, and I think most importantly, is the book of Habakkuk conveys to us God's sovereignty. And uh, in my humble opinion, I think that's uh, probably the uh, what shall I say, the most emphasis, the biggest emphasis. Or as my father used to say, in my humble opinion, of which I have a very high regard, <laughs> that the sovereignty of God is really expressed throughout, throughout the book. We see Habakkuk is controlled by God. God is in control of armies. God is in control of justice. God is in control of nature. God is in control of nations. God is in control of kings. And God's even in control of outer space. The sun and the moon is mentioned in the book of Habakkuk. The opening verses reveal anything but praise and thanksgiving. What we see in Habakkuk's emotional outburst of frustration become, uh, be, uh, because of God's silence and inactivity. Habakkuk was uh, accusing God of never returning his calls, no pun intended. Habakkuk questions are part of the message, his burden. If you have a King James Version, the first word, first uh, verse in Habakkuk will say the burden of Habakkuk. Uh, the Nasby says the oracle. What was said became Habakkuk's burden. What God told 
uh, Habakkuk became his problem for the remainder of the book. Habakkuk was, a, was accusing God of being inactive in his life. Habakkuk's questions are part of the message. How could a just God use a wicked nation to punish God's chosen people? And why does evil in Judah go unpunished? Age-old questions. Habakkuk helps answer these age-old questions. Why do the righteous suffer along with the books of Job and First and Second Peter? Answers the, helps answer the question for us, why do the righteous suffer? Habakkuk was truly seeking answers to these questions, just as we do today. Those are important questions in our life. And we need answers to those questions. God did not strike Habakkuk down for these questions. To Habakkuk's surprise, God did answer him. And when we read... Uh, uh, when we uh, read chapter uh, 1, verse 5, we, uh, we observe the beginning of God's answer to Habakkuk. The Bible says, the different translations, marvel wondrously, or wonder marvelously, or be astonished, or be utterly astonished, and wonder. God does answer his prayer in a special way. All we know about Habakkuk is given to us in the book of Habakkuk. We do not know his origin, his family, or anything else about him other than he was a prophet. That is, his name is mentioned twice in the book. Now, Habakkuk was uh, a uh, prophet who prophesied before the Babylonian captivity. That makes him a pre-exilic prophet. Now there's some dates that you really need to remember from the Bible to help you understand secular history and biblical history. For example, let me give you, let me give you several dates. You might want to write them down and just memorize them because it will help you in uh, correlating uh, secular history with biblical history and vice versa. For example, the approximate date of Moses is 2000 B.C. The approximate date of Abraham was 1400 B.C. So things that happened in 2000 B.C. happened at about the time of Moses. Things that happened around 1400 B.C. was the time of Abraham. King David lived around 1,000 B.C., so things that happened in secular history that happened around 1,000 B.C. happened uh, around King David, King David's time. And then uh, after King David, there was a div divided kingdom. The northern kingdom went up to, uh, uh, went up to the north, <laughs> where Samaria was the capital and uh, Judah and another tribe stayed down south. Well, there was a divided kingdom. Not long after that uh, was when uh, Jerusalem was captured. Another date you need to remember is 722 B.C. when Assyria captured the northern kingdom of Israel. The ten tribes that went to the north fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Assyria had risen to power and had conquered the northern kingdom. And now we come to the date of 586 B.C. when Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the time that Habakkuk is prophesying. Habakkuk was a real Jewish man, a prophet of God, who lived around 600 B.C. In 586 B.C., Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, this was part of Habakkuk's problem because God revealed to him what was going to happen. And the southern kingdom of Judah was going to fall into the hands 
of King Nebuchadnezzar, and Habakkuk did not like it. Well, let's look at some of this in Habakkuk to, to begin with. To look at your Bible in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, and look what it says. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me to see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contentions arise. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never held out. And wickedness is around me and justice is all perverted. Wah, wah, wah. Can you see that in him? Now, that's the first five verses. Habakkuk is speaking here. In these first four verses, excuse me. Violence, iniquity, wickedness, destruction, strife. The law is unjust. Wickedness surrounds it. Justice is perverted. Sounds like the morning newspaper, doesn't it? Or, well, I shouldn't say that. I hadn't read the newspaper in 30 years. I don't, uh, don't even watch national news. Watch local news and get the weather. That's it. You hear these things all the time. The, the, bad, the bad things are always happening. This is, this is nothing new. Well, Habakkuk was coming to God and complaining to God what, what was happening. Well, as I was studying this, I asked myself the question, why in the world was Habakkuk so upset? What was it that made him uh, just fly off in a tirade like that? What was it that that caused him to be so unnerved. Well, I want us to go back and look at Jeremiah. Turn, hold your place in the back. And go to the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was a contemporary of Habakkuk. So, what Jeremiah and Habakkuk wrote about were things that happened before the seventy-year captivity. So, they would be called a pre-exilic prophet. An example of an exilic prophet would be uh, Daniel. Daniel wrote ab about the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Those things happened in captivity in Babylon. He would be an exilic prophet. Now, I call Ezra and Nehemiah a post-exilic prophet, although some people don't classify them as prophets. They are prophets as far as the writing of the book is concerned, their book. They would be considered post-exilic because they prophesied after the exile. Now, on Sunday night, Mark has been preaching to us so eloquently about Nehemiah who went back to Jerusalem after the 70-year captivity and began to rebuild the wall. Ezra went back after the captivity and began to rebuild the temple. So all the things that Ezra and Nehemiah described to us are things that happened after the 70-year captivity. So now I'm taking you back in time from Pastor Mark from the end of the 70-year captivity to the beginning. And Habakkuk is, is saying, everything's bad. Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing the Chaldeans to to judge God's people. And why is there so much sin? Why is there evil? Why does the law go uh, unjust? So now we're uh, at a time before the fall of Jerusalem with, with Habakkuk. So what is it that made him so unnerved about what he knew? Now I know that Jeremiah and Habakkuk knew each other. They had to because of some of the things they wrote were similar. And there was two or three other, uh, what is it, Ezekiel, Zephaniah. There was some, I forget. Give, there was four or five of them that were contemporaries there. All right, now, I want you to look with me in uh, the book of Jeremiah. 
and uh, look in chapter 21. We're going to look at look at a couple of chapter, a couple of verses here in two or three chapters. Chapter 21, verse 2, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is warring against us. And then down in verse 7, Then afterward declares the Lord, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and his people, even those who survive in this city from pestilence, sword, and famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 9, He that dwells in the city will die by the sword and famine, pestilence, but he who goes out and falls away to the Chaldeans who is besieging you will live. And so God is, God is telling the people you must be subject to Nebuchadnezzar. You must surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that doesn't sound too nice, does it? Surrender to the enemy. But that's what God tells them to do. So that's what Jeremiah begins to preach. No wonder Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. <laughs> and no wonder Habakkuk was a little bit unnerved uh, ab about all of this. What was going to happen to Judah is described in chapter 22 as, as uh, birth pains. And so we come over here to uh, uh, chapter 24 it says after Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had carried away captive uh, Jeconiah and his son Jehoiakim the king of Judah and the officials of Judah with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem and brought them to Babylon so there was a wave of captives that went to Babylon so, there are, so they are some of them are already there in Babylon. Now, Jeremiah had a problem. Jeremiah was going around saying there's going to be a 70-year captivity. The false prophets were going around saying, I nah, don't worry about it. It's only going to be two years. It'll be, don't, don't worry about it. Well, let me ask you this. Which one would you rather believe? Which one would you want to believe? I would want to believe the two-year guy. Well, uh, J Jeremiah had this problem. Look at, uh, oh, look at chapter 25, verse, uh, verse 3. Jeremiah says, I I've been preaching these some 23 years now. And verse 8, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of of the north declares the Lord and Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and capture the city now look at look at uh, chapter 28 in chapter 28 this is the record of Hananiah the false prophet who's going around preaching in verse 3 Hananiah says within two years I am going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house which Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took away. So Jeremiah is saying there's going to be a 70 year captivity. This guy Hananiah says no it's going to be two years. Now look at verse look at verse 10 chapter 28 verse 10. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke it. Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Even so will I break within two full years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of the nation. Then Jeremiah went away, but he came back later. And in verse 13, Jeremiah says, You broke the wooden yoke, but God's going to give you an iron yoke. I about had a heart attack when Mike brought that yoke up here. I said, oh, no, he's going to preach my sermon tonight <laughs> with that yoke. So Jeremiah uses this illustration of the yoke, and Hananiah symbolically breaks it. But Jeremiah says, nope, that's not going to be it. 
there's going to be an iron yoke. Now, in chapter 29, Jeremiah gives instructions to the exiles who are already in Babylon. There's a group of several thousand who went to Babylon. They went in two or three or four different ways. So Jeremiah writes this letter to them, and in verse 4 he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat, eat the produce, take wives and become the, the fathers of sons and daughters and take wives and their, for their sons and daughters, for their husbands, bear, bear children, daughters, mul multiply and increase. Seek the welfare of the city. Now that's a strange thing. Do pray for Babylon. Pray for those wicked Chaldeans. He says, seek the welfare of the city. Because if you... If the city goes well, then everything's going to be well with you. Look what he says. I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. So he tells them to pray for the enemies. I don't even want to do that. <laughs> pray for the enemy. The Bible tells us to pray for the enemy. That's the instructions to him. Verse 10 in chapter 29. For thus says the Lord, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. So Jeremiah is going around saying there's going to be 70 years of captivity. Because of Israel's continued sin and rejection of God and rebellion of God, God sends them into uh, captivity into uh, uh, Babylon. So in 586 B.C., uh, Jerusalem falls to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. There was a major battle that was fought called the Battle of Carchemish, which was over east of, of uh, Judah. And Babylon had defeated uh, the uh, uh, Egyptians, and they were on their way to Judah. So Habakkuk knew that their time uh, was uh, uh, numbered, that soon uh, Nebuchadnezzar would be uh, besieging the city. Now, turn with me to chapter 52. Now, God told Jeremiah that, we mu that uh, Judah must surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, in chapter 52, in verse, last part of verse 3, it says, And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And he wasn't going to submit to the king of Babylon. And so the Bible tells us about this, the sieging of the city. And Zebuchadnezzar, uh, Zedekiah, uh, Zedekiah and uh, some of his men escaped through uh, a special route, got out into the desert. They were captured by uh, the Babylonians. And in verse 9 it says, And they captured the king, Zedekiah, and brought him up to, to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath. And he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And he also slaughtered all the princes of Judah in Riblah. Then he blinded the eyes of Zedekiah. That's the kind of guy Nebuchadnezzar was. And then Zedekiah died in prison in Babylon. So we see Jerusalem fall. And a brief, brief description of what is going to happen and what Habakkuk had to look forward to. Now turn, turn back to the book of Habakkuk chapter 1. So no wonder Habakkuk was upset that the wicked Babylonians were going to pass judgment upon God's people, and he didn't like it. 
All right, let's look at this, these verses again in chapter 1. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. This is the message which was revealed to Habakkuk. And this oracle or this message became his burden. How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you do not hear? I cry, and you, uh, I cry to you violence, yet you do not say, Why do you make me see iniquity and then wickedness, destruction, contention, strife, law is ignored, never upheld, wickedness, justice is perverted. So he describes what's going on. In chapter 1, we see Habakkuk worrying and wondering. Oh, woe is me, he said. Why do I get to see all these bad things? Why are you revealing all this to me? Why are you doing this? Everything's bad. The law's uh, uh, perverted. Justice is everywhere. Wickedness is everywhere. Why is all this being revealed? You, you, you don't need to be doing this, God. Worrying and wondering. I'm a big worry wart. See this hair on my head? I know where you get it. It's inherited. You get it from your kids. He's worrying and wondering. Oh, me. Look, look, God, look at all these things around. I call and I cry. The, these two words here are actually two different words in the, in the Hebrew. One is just a call. I call out and I pray. Then the other one uh, uh, is, is actually a, a raised voice. I cry. I cry violence. And you don't do anything. So not only does he pray and he worries. But he calls and he, and he raises his voice. Why God why? Look what he says in, in these verses. How long will you, will you make me see? In verse, verse 3. Why do you show me these things? Now let me ask you a question about that. If God answered all of your whys in life, would, would you be a better person? If God answered all of your whys, would you be a better father, mother, child, student, neighbor? If God answered all of your whys in life, would you be satisfied? My answer is no, you would <laughs> because then there'd just be another why. Habakkuk had to learn what the sovereignty of God meant. So in chapter 1, we see him worrying and wondering, fretting over what God is going to do. Now look with me in, well, let me, let me look at uh, uh, verse 5 because God begins to speak. Look at verse 5. Look among the nations, observe. God just simply says, yes, yes, look, look. Be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days. You would not believe it if I tell, told you. So Habakkuk cries and he prays and he complains to God. So God says, I'll, I'm going to answer you, but you're not going to like it. And he did, and he did it. So we find him worrying and wondering. All of chapter 1, don't have time to go through any more of chapter 1. He's worrying and wondering and fretting. Now we come to chapter 2. We find the, find the prophet watching and waiting. Look at verse 1. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And how the preacher is to respond to me when I am reproved so that the preacher can help me with all my problems when I go to him. You better check your version on that. That's not <laughs> and he said, he said how, and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it in the tables for the one who reads it may run. Spread the news. Yeah, write it down. Write the vision down so that others will know, know the vision. So here's what's happened to Habakkuk. 
In chapter 1, we see him worrying and wondering. In chapter 2, we say, well, wait a minute. Maybe God's right after all. Maybe God is sovereign after all. Maybe God does know what he's doing after all. Now, I don't know the time lapse between chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. If it was days, weeks, or months, or years. But Habakkuk had to go through a process to, to understand the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm standing here before you and tell you that I do not understand the sovereignty of God. I can't explain it outside of the Bible. And I dare say you can't either. We just trust God. God says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Or it's settled because God said it. Like the old-fashioned preacher says, I, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I even believe the cover, it says, genuine leather. If the Bible says it, we must accept it. I cannot explain the sovereignty of God outside of how God describes his sovereignty. He is sovereign over creation, the animals, outer space, nations, uh, kings. He is sovereign. So Habakkuk has to get himself in a position to see things from a different perspective. You see where he gets? Look, look, look where he gets. I will get in my guard post and station myself on the rampart. Now, usually the rampart was a, a special place on a, on a wall around the city where the guards would, would sit have to have clear view uh, to protect the city. So Habakkuk says, I need to see things from God's perspective. Just like we do. We need to see things from God's perspective to understand what he is doing, how he is working, and who he is. God is sovereign and God is in control. Now, chapter 2, we see the five woes, called the five woes of Habakkuk. Go, we go through all those maybe another time. Come to chapter 3. In chapter 1, we're seeing worrying and wondering. And Habakkuk says in chapter 1, God, you're inactive in my life. You don't hear my prayers. You don't care about me. Then we come to chapter 2, and he says, I need to see things from God's perspective. I need to get, need to get in a different uh, position to see things like God sees them. Now look what happens in chapter 3. We see him worshiping and, one, worshiping and witnessing. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigunov. Some kind of musical notation uh, of probably of... Uh, uh, enthusiasm or something. It's not, not clear what that word means. So this whole chapter 3 is a psalm, just like in the book of Psalms. It's Habakkuk's song, a psalm. Look what he said, the prayer of Habakkuk. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Habakkuk 3.3 3 is one of my favorite verses. Some people say, well, where did God come from? You tell me you're a preacher. Where did God come from? I said, well, if I show you, will you believe me? So open it up, it says, God came from Teman. Oh, 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 well, well. <laughs> of course, it's in jest. So we find him worshiping and witnessing in chapter 3. Now, go to the end of chapter 3, oh, verse 17. Look how he concludes. This is quite a bit different from that of chapter 1. Look what he says beginning in verse 17. 
Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit of the vines, though the uh, yield of the olive shall fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock uh, should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt the Lord. That's quite a bit of difference from chapter 1 to chapter 3, isn't it? Worshiping and witnessing for the Lord. Resign, resign himself to the fact that God is sovereign. I can remember the time that, that I personally understood the sovereignty of God. Now, I told you a while ago, I don't understand it, but, I, but there was a time that it dawned on me that God is sovereign. I was pastor of Central Baptist Church over here in Brandon. Sitting in my office studying something. It had been so long ago, I don't know what it was. And all of a sudden, it's just like somebody flipped the light on about God's sovereignty, that God really is in control. Look what he says here in this. It doesn't matter if there's no, no food, everything fails, the, there's no grapes on the vine, there's no oil from the olive oil, the fields don't produce, the, the flocks are gone, the cattle is gone. I'm going to trust God. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk in my high places. Now, those are uh, deer's feet, like, like the feet of a deer, how sure they are. Have you ever seen a deer run? They can run fast and not stumble. And they're very agile. And their feet are sure, especially in mountainous areas. You'd see, see the uh, deer climb up the mountain, side of the mountains. And the picture he here is that of stability and trust because God is our strength and God is our guide. The, the Lord God is my strength. And he will make me walk in the high places as opposed to the low places. There's places that are low places in our life. We get down, we get low. God makes us to walk in high places. Habakkuk had to go through some kind of process to go from worrying and wondering to from, to, from fretting to worshiping and witnessing for the Lord. Now I'm going to conclude here. I've got a, got a couple more minutes. Look at chapter 2. Verse. Uh, verse 2. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. This, this thing is going to happen in the future. It, has ha it, uh, it hastens toward the goal. And it will not fail. Though it tarries. Wait for it. For it will certainly come, it will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, that is Babylon, his soul is not upright in him. Then here's a key verse. But the righteous will live by his faith. I like the King James Version because that's the one I memorized first. The just shall live by faith, his faithfulness. Habakkuk had to learn that the, the righteous before God had to live by faith. Not by sight, not by, not by uh, bank accounts, not by armies, not by military strength, not by governments. Live by faith. And Habakkuk had... Uh, Oh, many perils to face. He knew what was going to happen in the near future. And, Bible, and uh, Judah was going to fall. Jerusalem was going to be captured. And all of God's people were going, going to be taken into captivity into Babylon. All because they would not turn from their sin, wouldn't, wouldn't turn from their idols, and turn to God. And so God used, this, used the wicked nation of Babylon to bring 
judgment and justice on his people. I heard just this week somebody say, that's not fair. I heard somebody say, well, you know, you, you Baptist preachers, you know, whenever you say Baptist with a B in it, you know, you know something's wrong, Baptist. You, you believe in once saved, always saved, you Baptist. So you believe in the, in the, uh, <laughs> the word escaped me, election. Okay, well, if that, that is not fair. How do you know who's elect and who's not? You, you don't know. I said, no, you don't. You're not God. That's the whole point. We are not God. Well, it's just not fair for God to do that. Well, I don't think it was fair for God to, to do this to Israel, but God is sovereign. God knew exactly what he was doing, and he did it. I think the overall message of Habakkuk is the righteous shall live by faith. We need to live by faith and trust God day by day for our daily lives. Just like the preacher said this morning, I, th I thought you was going to preach my sermon, Pastor Mike. He started using sovereignty and perseverance, perseverance and faith and all of those. <laughs> I wrote them down when you said them. I... Look, God loves you. He wants the best for you. Sometimes things do not go like we want them to. You ever prayed and you prayed and you prayed and your prayers don't get past the ceiling, it seems like? You pray and pray and then you call and call and call and you, and you holler and holler and holler. That's what Habakkuk did. Finally God answered him and said, Okay, Habakkuk, this, this is the way it is. We need to live by faith, trusting in God day by day. Habakkuk the prophet says, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you tonight for this brief time together. Help us, Lord, to live by faith day by day, to trust in you uh, day by day, and to honor you. Lord, we don't understand uh, all the time how you work in our lives. Uh, we don't understand uh, how you work in the world. We don't understand why certain things happen around the world and Lord we just have to trust that you're the sovereign God we trust in you we believe the Bible is God's word we can read God's word and be comforted we can go to you in prayer and be comforted we thank you Lord for dying on the cross for us and for the gift of eternal life that is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ Bless all these things in Christ's name. Amen.